Hi, welcome to Cyclopod. My name is Corey Clark, and I am an assistant professor of social psychology at Durham University in the UK, recording from my parents' house in Akron, Ohio, because <laughs> I'm in quarantine. Uh, this is my co-host. Oh, I'm guard, quarantined in an undisclosed location in Marietta, Ohio. No longer assistant professor at Marietta. <laughs> I have one month left. <laughs> Uh, and our guest host today is Calvin Lai. He's an assistant professor of psycho uh, psychological and brain sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. He is an expert on implicit bias or what people might um, refer to as unconscious bias. Uh, I know him from a social psychology summer camp that we went to back in, what, like 2014 or something? 13, I think. Yeah. <laughs> 2013. Um, but we asked him on today because Bo and I wrote uh, an article for Psych Inquiry um, where we talked about whether liberal biases affect the social sciences. And Calvin was one of our commenters. Um, and he wrote a really good critique of a lot of the evidence we proposed to support our position um, but we thought we could talk to him a little, about, a little bit about implicit bias, what's going on with IAT, how it relates to um, the claims that Bo and I make, and are Bo and I just uh, dead wrong <laughs> about our analysis? Um, so Calvin, do you maybe want to get started just by telling us a little bit about, so I think our, our listeners are a mixture of some academics, but also some non-academics, so not everyone probably knows what implicit bias is or how it's measured. Um, and it's a pretty popular concept in psychology. So maybe you could explain a little bit about what it is and what is the history of the IAT? Why is it so important? And maybe the status of it today? OK, uh, I'm going to try to answer a lot of those questions. That's a big but if question. I forget or miss some, <laughs> uh, let me know. Uh, so implicit biases are uh, thoughts and feelings within our minds uh, that are uh, often but not always outside of conscious control or conscious awareness. Uh, and they seem to be related to how we make sense of people based on what social groups they belong to, whether they uh, on the basis of race or gender or so on. Uh, and one of the kind of most popular ways to understand these implicit biases swirling around in our minds is with something called an implicit association test, which is this kind of video game of sorts where you sort images to two sides of a screen and we measure how quickly you are uh, able to, for example, pair black people with good things versus white people with good things in this little video game. And that tells us something about how um, memories are kind of linked up in our minds. And over the past 20 or 30 years, it seems that um, these kind of implicit biases that we measure through tests like the implicit association test seem to be related to uh, our conscious biases and beliefs and prejudices, and at least on some occasions, our behavior as well. And so there's been a lot of interest in understanding why that is, what these implicit biases are exactly, right? How unconscious are they? How much they reflect these kind of gut impulses and so on? Uh, and uh, what's been key for my research program is understanding, well, um, assuming that they can have some impact on our behavior, what can we actually do about it? How can we intervene so that people uh, can act more in line with their explicit conscious values rather than these implicit biases? And you um, wrote, or you have a meta-analysis that came out like a year ago with Patrick Forscher. Um, do you want to tell people a little bit about that one? Because I think that's really interesting um, coming from you, especially someone who's been working on implicit bias. Um, and then the, the findings of that one was like, what do you have, like 640 studies or something? Um, I, I keep on forgetting the number. I just know we were the second <laughs> largest <a> <laughs> in social psychology. Um, there's a paper, there's a meta-analysis on intergroup contact that beats us, but just like, like mm -hmm. 10 or 20 studies. I'm so jealous. Um, <laughs> but um, so when I entered grad school about 10 years ago, um, there was this idea that if we could change these implicit biases, right, if we change these um, kind of uh, maybe potentially unconscious, potentially difficult to control biases inside our minds, then we could uh, reduce discrimination in all these different places, we could perhaps unlock um, a solution that would help with all these cases where our impulses conflict with our um, our kind of higher level beliefs, right? Not just in terms of discrimination, but maybe also things like 
problems related to addiction, unwanted anxiety, and so on. Uh, and so all this effort has been put into figuring out how to change these implicit biases. And what we did is we conducted a meta-analysis to put all these studies together and try to empirically examine the extent to which changes in these implicit biases are related to downstream changes in some type of behavior that people are interested in, right? So that could be things like reductions in discrimination, uh, uh, reductions in um, uh, you know, alcohol addiction relapse, et cetera, et cetera. And the surprising finding was that although um, uh, these kind of experimental interventions that social scientists had tested were effective at changing implicit bias and they were effective at changing some of these downstream behaviors, it looked like through a, a statistical analysis called mediation that changes in behavior were not statistically explained by changes in implicit bias, which suggests that, which is kind of inconsistent with this idea that changing your implicit bias will lead to downstream changes in behavior. Um, and so that kind of really blew the door wide open in terms of, okay, well, if changing implicit bias doesn't change behavior, for those of us that are more practically interested in, in these things, what does, that, what does that mean, right? Like, is there something wrong with how we conducted our studies? Are we looking at the wrong behavioral outcomes? Are we measuring the implicit biases um, in some kind of uh, uh, suboptimal way? Are they just too noisy of a measure? Or maybe it's telling us something theoretically that maybe these implicit biases are not um, causal forces in themselves, but a side effect of just a lifetime of experience, right? The, the kind of mental residue left over from everything else that our, our mind is doing. Um, and so that's kind of where we left off with the meta-analysis. We don't totally know what it means, but we found a problem, right? We found mm -hmm. a, a dilemma, right? What's, what's going on here with why the changing implicit biases doesn't change behavior? Could you give an example of an intervention that would be used to attempt to change uh, an implicit bias? Yeah. Um, so there are some strategies that um, are going to align really well with how we often change our explicit biases or prejudices. So for example, if uh, you regularly have contact or experiences with a member of another race, um, that's going to change your explicit prejudice. That's also going to presumably change your implicit biases as well. And then there are also some interventions that are more narrowly focused on just changing the implicit biases. So that could be as simple as these kind of um, conditioning style paradigms that you would often learn about in Psych 101, where we just simply show, for example, someone of another race and maybe uh, a cute image or something. So then you start <laughs> to form positive associations in your head between um, this person of another race and, and good things. Mm -hmm. um, and they find that in both in like, all these different what, types of cats or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like what is the cute thing? Ice cream or, cone. <laughs> yeah, um, like literally, like that's that's what we'll do. Um, uh, and um, it seems that you know when we're looking across this set of about sixty or so studies that look at both implicit biases and behavior, um, I do want to mention that a lot of these are also clinically oriented studies. So it's more like we give them something like you know cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. And then does that, you know, affect um, some clinical outcome in terms of like, you know, uh, some anxiety thing or addiction thing. Um, and um, regardless of the type of intervention and the ways that we could look at it, um, we didn't find this predicted mediation pattern. So mm -hmm. behavior will still changing, but just not through the implicit biases that we measured. Does it mean anything for the like unconscious bias training you're getting in organizations? Because I had to do an unconscious bias training at Durham and it was nothing like that. And it was very much just like an awareness based thing. Like if we tell you about this, <laughs> then maybe it'll help. Has anyone even bothered testing the effectiveness of those sorts of uh, interventions? Yeah, so that's a, that's a common um, question. And I think a lot of times people confuse trying to change implicit bias Mm -hmm. With these um, professional development sessions that we get, uh, you know, through our various companies or organizations or universities or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that they're actually really quite different. There is some overlap. And I think there, it's a little confusing because uh, some of, of us researchers that like to study changing implicit bias also like to study this kind of diversity education workshop stuff, like mm -hmm. me. So I think mm -hmm. that also muddies the waters. But they're really different. So I like to think of, you know, these efforts to change implicit bias. Um, uh, to be kind of targeting it at a much more basic level, right? So diversity education, you can kind of think of it like almost as like a training program 
like you know if you were taught a new approach to dieting or doing exercise right um but what trying to change implicit bias is like is like trying to change your opinions about things like chocolate bars and potato mm -hmm. chips and and cheeseburgers um mm -hmm. so just because we can't seem to be doing a very good job at changing our kind of um automatic opinions about potato chips and cheeseburgers and whatnot doesn't mean that we can't still educate it uh, in a way that can be effective and that can drive behavior change. And so I have a whole separate line of research where, uh, and there's a whole separate kind of field of research is looking at this question of to what extent can these diversity education workshops, you know, be it about implicit bias or some other topic, uh, whether that can actually work or not. And I think the jury um, is, is more, um, the jury is still out on whether they can work and under what conditions they can work. Does it seem like people have jumped the gun then with how widespread these interventions have gone before they've been tested um, thoroughly? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think that this, you can't kind of escape your kind of personal moral commitments on this type of thing or your, your value judgments on when is it ready. Um, I think the the kind of longstanding phenomenon is that you know diversity training is not a new thing. It's been going mm -hmm. on for fifty some years, mm -hmm. um, and so it would be you know quite a shift in gears to just suddenly take a moratorium. And uh, at least I've argued elsewhere that you know it, we do know more than we think in the sense that diversity education is still education. It's still teaching. Um, and we know a lot about how teaching works and how to do um, effective teaching. Um, so I do think that there are some things that we can kind of take for granted in terms of what it might be able to do. I think um, that said, though, we don't know as much specifically about diversity education as we would like, particularly about these kind of new waves of things like implicit bias education or cultural competence education, uh, which have only you know kind of really risen in popularity in the past. 10 or 15 years, right? Like there are many different ways, for example, of teaching about math and some curricula are just gonna be better or worse. We just don't know about what these new curricula are like. Does that kind of address the question? I don't think I fully answered it. Oh, I think we froze for, okay, I got you back. Oh, <laughs> It'll be okay. <laughs> oh, it was just me. The one oh. recording, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm curious if you think that our characterization, so in the paper that Bo and I wrote, we sort of suggested that one reason this idea of these implicit biases and how these might be the thing that predicts prejudicial behavior um, against maybe minority groups in particular, um, one reason these might have become so popular when the evidence for them, I would say, seems pretty mixed uh, regarding how are they related to prejudicial behavior actually? Does targeting them do anything at all? Um, if not, why does it seem like people have been acting like they're the big solution to fixing society for so long? We talk about how Hillary Clinton mentioned uh, implicit bias in her um, campaign speech. So it seems to be the whole concept of implicit biases has been maybe one of the greatest achievements of social psychology, or at least that's what we thought for a while. You don't, you, maybe you disagree with that. But in terms of how much attention it's been given, how well known the concept is, how much it's affected the actual, the real world outside of academia, it seems to be a pretty big concept. Um, and Bo and I suggested the possibility that maybe the reason it got this outsized attention, maybe people were a little premature and how much they embraced the concept and the importance of the concept is because it would be something that liberals would like. Okay, uh, I, have, oh, I have so <laughs> many takes on this. Um, I think so, maybe I said too much. Um, well, so I, I wanna separate two things first off and maybe we can kind of tailor the conversation that way. Um, I think there's hype within the scientific community and then there's hype mm -hmm. in the outside world. Yeah, that's a good point. And I do think yeah. that there are very different ways of thinking about depending on which, where you wanna direct your attention to. So yeah. which one, should I talk about first, I guess? <laughs> Which would you prefer he talk about first, Bo? <laughs> well, so it's interesting. Would you say before trying to make that distinction that P 
people who in the scientific community are more cautious about their claims have done a bit to stoke the fires of public popularity on the issue. So I'm thinking, for example, there's the book on IAT, um, the popular book. What's that called? Um, do you remember? Uh, this Blink, Blink. Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. No, no, I'm sorry, not Blink. The one that um, I think Benaji and Greenwald, did they write it? Blind Spot. Yeah. yeah. So they make some claims in there, and I should have written this down, but they make claims in there that I don't know that they would make in the actual scientific literature because they're maybe a little bit more bold than I think people would accept in the peer-reviewed literature. <laughs> is there is is that a fair statement? And I've also seen them interviewed on popular like news segments, and it seems as though they make claims again that might not be something that they would feel comfortable making in peer-reviewed literature. So I think the two do influence each other. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think I think that's actually a, a fair point. So I think maybe it's better to kind of talk to them together in that way. Um, first off, I have to confess, uh, hopefully Mazarin and Tony never see this. I never read their book. <laughs> I have a signed copy. Hi, Mazarin. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I have a signed copy. I've worked with them both, but I've just never thought, like, I need to read their pop science version sure. of what we do together. Right. Um, um, so I think one of the tensions is that in the scientific literature, I think that, um, you know, in some ways, uh, the research on implicit bias and on these measures of implicit bias have, they're, they're gigantic. And since their inception, there have been many critiques from every different direction to really try to get to the bottom of, of what uh, is going on, particularly with these kind of tests like the implicit association test. Um, and so there I'm, I, I've, I've not, not been as much worried about the kind of like so-called hype because I, I think that in some ways this is kind of, I see this as a, a science that is proceeding well in the sense that there's a lot of attention and there's a lot of uh, uh, criticism and responses to criticism. And so it's not just like a small pocket of researchers that are just publishing stuff where there is no pushback. Um, I think one of the tricky things is that in the public sphere, when we talk about implicit bias, it seems that a lot of times uh, both members of the public and scientists are using a, a somewhat kind of broader, more expansive uh, definition than what you know you might see them say in scientific papers. And I think part of what why at least you know I'm I'm also one of the folks that do this at least part of why I do it is because I think that implicit bias for lay folks means something different than what implicit bias means for scientists, right? So implicit bias has become this kind of umbrella term to capture all these subtle forms of prejudice or discrimination that aren't so well captured by, um, uh, you know, our kind of old school KKK style views of prejudice. Um, and um, so as a result, I think a lot of times when I'm speaking that's to the media, I know school. that's okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's so old you, get a, you can go older school than that if you want it. <laughs> um, but like, you know, when I'm personally talking to journalists, I know when they're saying that word, they're not saying it in the kind of nerdy way that I uh, talk about in footnote one of my paper. They're talking about this broader form of subtle bias. Right. And I think that even if you were to throw away all this literature, on the implicit association test and its cousins, there's so much research. Uh, all of us have published in various forms in this room, this digital room, um, showing that people can discriminate, people can be biased without them being aware that they are being biased. Yeah. And I think that a lot of the times, if we are trying to be sympathetic to at least some of us scientists doing the public communication, that's what at least I'm thinking I'm speaking about. So if there is a discrepancy in terms of how I'm using the terms, that, that would explain why I would at least be not so consistent between what I say in the media versus what I say uh, in a particular journal article. Does that, that capture it? Yeah, that seems fair. I wonder, though, if there's a problem there and then that, let's say you're doing, you're talking about scores on an IAT test or something, right? And the popular understanding of implicit bias is this this sort of more, this broader category than what we actually mean when we're talking about IAT scores. 
So it's easy to get to have people even in the popular media to misunderstand that and think that an IAT score is somehow measuring the larger category rather than the more circumscribed construct that you're talking about in your scientific literature. Yeah, and I think that's a real big tension. And it's one that, to me, I feel like there is no easy solution, right? It's not like a couple of us researchers can band together and say, hey, right. everyone else in the public, <laughs> please change your terminology. Right. The, right. The, the horse is out of the barn at this point. Um, and so I think my feeling is that we just kind of have to work with the fact that there is a folk intuition of what the concept is and a scientific meaning, just as there often is with a lot of other uh, psychological terms like, you know, emotion or morality, right? Sure. What researchers mean yeah. by it might diverge from the public sense of it. And um, if it definitely does create issues. And you could imagine if we had the time machine, knowing everything we know about the science now, like, would would we have chosen different terms? I wish, I think that we would have, mm -hmm. but we didn't know that, um, you know, 25 years ago when the first paper coining the term uh, came out. Um, so I, I, I think that this is one of these kind of um, historical accidents that's really hard to correct. And I've talked about this with a couple of colleagues. I can't think of a single time where something like this has happened, where the public terminology diverges from the scientific one, where then the scientists can then just have like course corrected back again and right. fix the terminology for the public. It's like once a term right. takes hold, it's there's very little that the original scientists can can do, particularly yeah. when it captures the public imagination, like bias. Yeah, that's probably a good point. So then he, here's a, a fundamental question that I have about a lot of this research, which is what counts as a bias? And this is something <laughs> that Corey and I have debated or discussed many times. And is it possible, as Phil Tetlock says or asked, mm. to be a Bayesian bigot? <laughs> that is, if I recognize actual differences in the world, and that shows up as quote unquote a bias, should we count that as a bias, or should that be perfectly reasonable human human uh, mental behavior capturing actual base rates in the world? Yes. Yeah, so, so take like the association between like if people have an association between men and math, for example. A slightly stronger association between men and math and women and math and it turns out men are slightly better at math or at least at the tail end let's say. at the tail end yeah yeah, yeah. um i mean at least my personal opinion on this I'm and then you have like, that association um sorry it looks like i cut off for a second um my oh. personal opinion is like first off what do we mean by bias like what is our actual definition i think mm -hmm. that with a lot of these types of discussions or like ambiguities about what counts we should start with the basic definitions and I have a really basic definition that most members of the public don't use of bias, which is that it's just a response tendency okay. for in one direction versus the other. And mm -hmm. so that takes out a lot of the value judgment, Yeah, a, a lot of the mm -hmm. arguments about, well, what is the correct level? Um, mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm comfortable saying, for example, that these implicit biases are biases. They're a response mm -hmm. tendency to respond more quickly and with less error one way versus another. And that's also a, a, a way that bias has often been defined in at least some pockets of the cognitive science literature, right? Where we're just talking about people tend to do this when put in this situation. Um, right, so, oh, I'm sorry, but, go ahead. But I, I do recognize that like lots of folks are often thinking about bias in terms of like some moral standard or in comparison to some moral standard or some kind of rational or objective standard. Right. And I feel like those discussions often kind of just they just like kind of just you know explode and, and never resolve in any clean way and so that's that's why at least operationally in terms of me doing my science I like the really basic response tendency definition so, so your definition I, I think I, I understand the, the, the sort of simplistic purity of that but I think the reason people maybe get disconcerted with that definition is because according to that definition if I displayed fear, more fear at seeing a bear than a squirrel, that would count as a bias according to that definition, right? Yeah. Even Yes, okay. And so because the word bias has so many negative connotations, I think if you said I'm biased about men in math, that sounds bad. It sounds like something I would like to avoid. And so I get your point scientifically. It's like, let's make this definition that we're not going to argue about all day. 
But herein is the problem with public communication again, where you start to say, well, people display a bias about this and it might be perfectly rational, but you're calling it a bias. And the people in the public read that and think that's a bias. And the writers at Vox think, oh, that's a <laughs> bias. That's bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's a it's a real issue and I'm not really sure. Um what the fix of it is because mm -hmm. I feel like most meanings of the word bias are going to be loaded with some type of um, moral commitment or, you know, some type of normative commitment on the part mm -hmm. of the people writing the word. Um, and so, I mean, you know, you can imagine, okay, well, all of us scientists will now collectively agree to use the word response tendency, <laughs> find your place in every <laughs> single paper. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I, 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 don't know. I, I... Well, I mean, I guess you... You could define bias as a deviation from optimal reasoning, right? So, so if you defined it that way, my fear at the sight of a bear would not be a bias. It, it, the fact that I was more afraid of a bear than a squirrel wouldn't be a bias. It would be a rational response to the world, right? I think part of the problem is it's so difficult to know what is the optimal response especially Agreed. for the things that we're studying. Agreed. I mean, I think bias is probably one of the terms that is used in the most different ways, even among social scientists. <laughs> like yeah. sometimes people yeah. think a bias means like you just are negative towards something or yeah, sometimes it means irrational. Sometimes it means wrong. Sometimes it means immoral. Like it, I, I think part of the problem is we want to have some kind of objective standard to compare, okay, let's say you have an association between men and math. Well, how big should that be to be optimal? If the difference is tiny, what does that look like on an IAT, for example? I have no idea. I don't think we really could say. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I like your definition, Calvin, but yeah, yeah, I think it's probably impossible to completely tease that apart from the assumption that both scientists, not all scientists, but a lot of scientists have, and certainly everyday people have, that it has to be wrong somehow or it has to be irrational right and I, I think that to go back to Bo's point about like you know against some type of optimal like what would you optimally do I think that oftentimes reasonable people can really disagree on what counts as optimal so even in like <laughs> let's say being afraid of a bear versus a squirrel right what about a bear versus a squirrel on the television screen is yeah. it rational for be to be more afraid of that bear on the television screen, even though it's just right. on the TV screen? Right. You know, and you can get into these very kind of nitty gritty philosophical debates about, you know, well, by this standard it's rational, but by this standard it's not rational. And so, right. I, I think that like it's kind of like no matter what type of definition you you want to use for this folk idea of, of bias, you're mm -hmm. gonna bump into issues. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah. Do, do, I, I totally agree with that, but I do. I actually do think that that philosophical debate's a really important one because we do morally judge people for their biases, and so we would like to know, right? Like, is it rational to have this bias, or is it almost completely irrational? We could start with like that division, and then like there are more subtle cases, of course. But like, let me give you a concrete example. Men pay more for car insurance than women do. Okay, now we, we could say that's a bias. The, the insurance companies are biased against men and, and that's a bad thing or something. Or we could make an argument that no, that's it's a rational calculation based on the likelihood of males getting into accidents versus females, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you were to kind of hold it to just the kind of like, you know, this kind of Bayesian standard of just what, is likely to happen, but you know other folks, you know when they're thinking of what counts as bias, might hold it to the in addition to the what is you know kind of optimally rational, also these kind of sets of moral standards that we ought to overlay, right? Some mm -hmm. of which might make that still okay, and some of which might be like, well, that's biased because it's violating this moral standard of right. impartiality. Yes. I'm, cu I'm yeah, curious, yeah. though, if if you're one of your research interests and one of actually really the general interests in implicit bias is that we could change them to make the world a better place. Isn't there an assumption there that these are bad? Because why would we want to change them otherwise? Or irrational. Something's wrong with them. Yeah. Um, 
so I can speak for myself. I'm not going to try to speak <laughs> for other researchers. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I do think that, you know, one of the core lessons of this research program is in some ways to destigmatize this idea that we are inclined or can discriminate without realizing, that we can be biased. Um, and um, Sorry, by destigmatize, you mean that people shouldn't feel like personally responsible for their implicit biases? I think that um, they should feel responsible for addressing them. Personally, this is just me speaking as a citizen. Sure. Um, but I think it, I, when I say destigmatize, I mean, like, the lesson here is that it's not a bad apple problem, necessarily, mm -hmm. that all of us are biased. It's not like mm -hmm. some of us are rational and some of us are irrational. Um, and for me, in terms of guiding my own research program, my personal interest is in the kind of subset of these subtle biases, these hidden biases that um, most people, including myself, would find objectionable in some way, right? Most of us don't want to act against our moral commitments. Most people mm -hmm. don't want to be racist. Most mm -hmm. people don't want to be sexist. And if we could find a way to disarm the kind of automatic aspects of our biases, that, you know, I think by most accounts would be good, right? That's mm -hmm. one less thing that, um, that's one unwanted aspect of people's selves that they don't have to wrestle with. Does that make sense? So are you saying they like are negative to the extent that the explicit and the implicit differ? Because explicit presumably is what you wish your attitude was. I think he's saying in so far as you have an explicit moral commitment to something that your implicit behavior or biases might contradict. Is that right? Yeah, right. And I think that, so for example, some of the places where this research has been most fruitful hasn't been on the kind of hot button topics of discrimination and prejudice, it's been on uh, helping people be less anxious, be less afraid, mm -hmm. be less um, uh, addicted to all these types of drugs, right? We all have these impulses that we don't want. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to me, you know, the way that I see it in terms of where I do have some value commitment is like, let's find tools so that we can eliminate that part or at least reduce its impact when we don't want it. Mm -hmm. um, and reasonable people can ag agree or disagree about when you would apply these tools, but at least we've got some tools to work with. Yeah, so Bo, Bo doesn't. Pardon? Um, oh no, Koi cut off. Okay. Cats. You broke Ice cream cones. <laughs> oh no. Oh, I was talking about it. Did I freeze again? Am I back? Yeah, yeah you're back. back. Yep. Okay. I'm saying if we paired airplanes and kittens for Bo, that might make him less Help afraid me of flying. <laughs> yeah, he won't fly. Yeah, I was going to say, though, it is interesting that you're saying, like, a lot of it, a lot of the research and what you're interested in maybe has to do with anxieties and drug addiction, et cetera. That's not what anybody in the public cares about. <laughs> right. You, you know, I don't think like, that's not, not, some people probably care well, about that. Not, when we hear IAT, though, I think we think sexism, racism, you know, like it's just that must be the sexier part of the research program, although it sounds as. But here, here's here's an interesting question to you, then, though. Do, do you think that we should go into any particular interaction with another person without bias? That is so like, let's say I'm interacting with a woman versus a man. Undoubtedly, I, I, in ways that I'm not fully conscious of, I, I have different expectations about how those interactions will go, what I could say, you know, how I should behave, etc. Because men and women, on average, are slightly different. I think that that's fine. That, that, to me, that's okay. That's something that a, a normal human should do, and that you would expect that our brains would be tailored to do that through thousands upon thousands of years of evolution. I think we might explicitly say we shouldn't do that because there's this notion that it's sexist to say, yes, I expect slightly different things from men and women. So I'm wondering like what you think about that. And maybe what would help here is if we could say, yes, on average, I expect my interactions with men and women to go slightly differently. Sometimes they don't. And I should be aware of that and adjust on the fly, of course. But it's okay to have that kind of an expectation. Um, 
so it's hard for me to answer that one straight in the sense that like so much of this is kind of going to depend on the particular situation sure. or or things like that right like where you know i think at least one of the lessons of implicit bias in other areas like it is that these are biases that exist because they help us uh, s simplify this really complex world around us into something, mm -hmm. some working assumptions that are actually going to be helpful mm -hmm. for social living and for survival. Right. Uh, and certainly, so I, even if I could flip a switch and make these biases go away, mm -hmm. it, it would be undesirable if people had no assumptions about other people going into right. interaction. Right. There's something often quite wise uh, about uh, these automatic assumptions that we make about others. Mm -hmm. The problem for me is that there are some situations and some contexts where um, in some ways there are bugs, right? There are places mm -hmm. where we don't want mm -hmm. them to work this way and yet they still mm -hmm. do, right? We don't mm -hmm. want to consider necessarily a person's race or gender when we're evaluating a new job candidate, but if right. it's infecting our judgment mm -hmm. and that violates my moral commitments, well, how do I get rid of that so it doesn't violate my moral commitments? Yeah. So th that's the type of situation that I'm uh, concerned about as an interventionist, um, not the fact that we just have biases. Yeah, I think that's very well put. And I, I think, and probably you do this in your writings and, and other people do as well, but I think some of that nuance is lost in the public discourse about this. So one thing I think we we could start by doing is saying, look, like, in many ways, it's very unnatural to attempt to judge, say, a, jo a job candidate without considering their demographic background. That's really hard to do. And to expect humans to do it without a lot of training and, and like incentive structures that force that upon them, it, it's, it's not reasonable to expect that. And it's not necessarily an individual failing. It's maybe a social failing, we could say. And, and I think we would probably be better if we were more open about these things and that having these things, like, as you said, there's, there's a lot of wisdom in a lot of them, right? It does make sense to consider somebody's demographic characteristics on average. That's why we do it because it does guide us to make better decisions in life. Often, sometimes it leads to serious problems, however. Yeah, certainly. And I think that like, you know, even in liberal circles, right, there's a lot of, often a lot of talk about things like, being culturally sensitive, being culturally competent, um, you know, understanding needs of different populations that we're serving. Mm -hmm. And all those are ways of talking about how, you know, it's not like we, we have to pretend that we don't see race or that we don't see ethnicity, but that we have to kind of wield it in a way that is um, uh, wise by, by, by some kind of moral standard, right? That people feel like they're being treated in a way that is kind of equitable or fair. So here's a here's like the the big question Corey and I get into, and maybe you don't have any particular moral insight here. Or you you don't know. <laughs> it's a hard question, but let's say that we. This is what I get down to with the moral debate. Let's say that we know that a particular demographic group is less likely to pay back their loans. Let's just make it men versus women to make it less offensive to people. So let's say. <laughs> So say men are less likely to pay back loans at a bank, even controlling for credit score. Is it fair for the bank to say, we're going to add in an, a slightly higher interest rate for men because we know this? Like that's to me the fundamental dilemma because I think you could go both ways. You could say, you know what? even though that's the Bayesian optimal decision-making strategy, it's also an affront to individualism. Or you could say, no, it's Bayesian optimal, and that's just how we should do it to make the best decision possible. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, you know, ultimately this drills down to questions of uh, morality, not social science, right? About what Fair enough. <laughs> you care for. Right. Um, uh, you I want have, to take a stance as a citizen? <laughs> yeah, as, as a citizen, um, I mean, I do think that, like, uh, you know, as a democratic society, that I we we sh should avoid uh, discriminating on the basis of race or gender for most things because it violates these uh, 
these values that we have for impartiality and fairness. Mm. And I think that um, that the uh, let me let me think about this for a second. Um, <laughs> I think that the circumstances in which we should use it are, are situations where it's really needed, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's often much more easy to swallow if laws are done on the basis of something other than uh, demographic group status. Yeah. So for example, in public polling on affirmative action, uh, lots of folks, uh, the majority of folks in the United States do not like affirmative action directly on the basis of race or ethnicity. Mm -hmm. But if you were instead to do affirmative action on the basis of socioeconomic status, yeah. or mm -hmm. instead of direct quota-based affirmative action, uh, you did um, uh, special recruiting or outreach programs to underserved populations. Those are things that people feel are more um, kind of uh, uh, fair to um, overall. And I think that if those strategies are available and they are effective enough, then we should probably rely on those rather than on the ones that are um, ones that uh, the population in general will reject. Now, certainly, though, I do think that there are probably going to be some circumstances where you can avoid using some of these demographic indicators um, where you know there isn't some other in, more indirect way that people would find more procedurally just. But I, I think that on many of these occasions, we can, we can kind of accomplish the same ends without doing so in a way that uh, a lot of people would find objectionable. So for you, though, it's really about like the social harmony. So the fact that people have these maybe intuitions about what what basis you can discriminate on or like what what factors are valid reasons to treat people differently and it's just whatever society feels is okay is what we should do um no i mean i think there's a right answer uh but it's my right <laughs> answer and I, I'm not this yeah. total moral relativist that thinks that you know whatever society thinks is okay is okay right. um but i think that you know different moral convincing are going to lead you into different directions. That's just my particular. You could view. probably do an interesting sort of like Rawlsian condition of ignorance and ask people, like you said, with the procedural fairness, like what would they accept if they didn't know who they were going to be? Yeah. That, that's yeah. actually maybe an interesting way of proceeding on that. Yeah. And Phil Tetlock had some great works, I think mostly in the 90s, where he would do these kind of studies where he would just set up like the Rawlsian paradigm and ask people what would you like society to be like um uh and I, I always thought that was like really cool and like i'm like surprised that other people haven't used that paradigm in social science research because i feel like you could um kind of really pick at what people's like intuitions are from that yeah reality. yeah because like Maybe we I should think, bring it back yeah. i mean wouldn't we would be we would all be okay with like police departments disregarding five-year-olds as murder suspects like, I don't think anyone would be like, well, we have to be impartial and maybe a five-year-old could have done it. We, we're like kind of okay with that. But when you start to get to, say, race or something, then I think people feel more squeamish about it. And maybe if you were in the Rawlsian ignorance, you would say, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to live in a society where people take race into consideration when they think about suspects or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is interesting because yeah, I feel like you don't get the same thing with gender for whatever reason. But well, if men um, are the ones who are harmed, you don't. Yeah. For if women had to pay more in car insurance, you better believe people would be. That's talking. probably right. Yeah. <laughs> We're okay with men paying more, but not. Women. But, and that is interesting. I'm fine with that. <laughs> men do pay more, and nobody yeah. really seems to care too much about it. And I, I mean, yeah, I but in the case of the bank one, to me, my intuition is that. Like if men were less likely to replay to repay their loans, then we wouldn't want that. But I think it's because it's something about spreading out the inefficiency over more people rather than punishing a smaller subset of people for the inefficiency. So it's like a small group of people getting punished more rather than everyone getting punished like a little bit. Yeah, but all men are getting punished more in the car insurance one, right? Yeah, they are. Yeah, like so Kelvin put... and I are paying more in auto insurance, slightly more. Yeah. <laughs> well, to be fair, I'm just a bad driver, so I'm okay with it. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, Bo's a bad driver, too, so that no, seems pretty... <laughs> ah, that's ridiculous. 
<laughs> so can we can we talk about your criticism of our paper that because um I think Corey and I both thought that it was one of the most uh, I thought it was like very thorough and insightfully like... critical. So it's like exactly the kind of you know discourse that we would like to have. Um, and so m maybe you could tell us what your problems or concerns with the paper were, and then we could I don't know back and forth it. Yeah. Uh, so I mean. If I'm to kind of summarize your paper quickly, you know, um, you have this argument that there is a lot of equalitarian bias in social science, where uh, social scientists seem to kind of uh, be biased in favor of uh, evidence kind of supporting equality between uh, socially social groups, uh, bias in favor of evidence of discrimination as the primary cause of group differences, and, and a kind of uh, a range of other things like that. Um, and you reviewed a bunch of evidence that seemed to be supportive of this idea, ranging from what social scientists tell us when we ask them to uh, experimental studies uh, and uh, places in the literature, in the research literature, where um, folks seem to be uh, uh, biased in terms of selectively interpreting things or cherry picking one thing or the other. Um, and what I responded in my response is basically I just went through a lot of that evidence and um, I was com coming from the perspective of you know someone who spends all his time thinking about how do we establish where discrimination is happening um, and it seemed that as a literature it's actually quite weak relative to other literatures on prejudice discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of great kind of suggestive evidence, a lot of smoke, but there isn't these kind of you know there isn't that kind of direct evidence that one would expect uh, given um, you know, all of the kind of public discussion about this. And I thought that was one of the things that kind of gave me a fair bit of pause, that we don't have uh, these studies demonstrating uh, uh, you know, direct, ideally experimental support for this idea that social scientists are acting on these uh, biases reinforcing equalitarian ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say that I don't think it's plausible. I think it's incredibly plausible because, you know, people talk about it all the time. There's all this kind of indirect evidence. But for something that we talk about so much, there isn't much evidence to show that it's really happening. Mm -hmm. And importantly, if, you, if this is something that you care about, that you want to intervene on, this evidence is important for knowing what to intervene on, mm -hmm. right? folks can often have these very strong intuitions about this is how discrimination happens for social group X, for the social group that I belong to or whatever. But then you collect the evidence and it turns out that it might not be happening or it happens in a very different way than you might expect. Um, and so that's where I think that, you know, it's, I'm kind of writing this from a position of just like, we need to know exactly how it's happening. And, and some of the, the smoke is not going to really necessarily get us there in terms of uh, knowing what to do or understanding the the magnitude of the issue. Yeah, so um, I think that's a really good point, and I think it's something that you noted, and I think um, Van Babel and his co-authors noted that it's really easy to exaggerate your own victimhood in some sense. So, like, <laughs> oh, everybody's biased. Why didn't my paper get published? The editors are biased, obviously. It must be, right? And and as you're saying, like, look, I, I think you said, I want to say it was ordinary claims need ordinary evidence or something, <laughs> which is, yeah, and, and absolutely, we, we think that that's true. And we, we, as you noted, and everybody noted, I sort of feel bad that I wrote this sentence now. I, I, I confess that our data were going to be anecdotal, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> and ended up getting it thrown into my face. <laughs> I was having second thoughts about that, but I left it in. <laughs> it is true. It is true. Like I, I wanted to yeah. be open about that. That's yeah. important to me. It's like I mean, you anticipated my critique. <laughs> yes. Like where are we at? What do we know? What don't we know? So there, I think where well. I didn't take exception to the comma. I have a few things that I would say about it. So one thing that you know, and, and then Corey, if you have something, of course, butt in. But one thing that you said is, so, so I think you agreed that one of the best sources of evidence is just what psychologists say when you ask them. 
And so here's my question to you, because you said, you know, well, sometimes people will say something and then it doesn't actually work that way, maybe because of incentives in the world, et cetera. But isn't it the case that the actual amount of prejudice you would see is probably greater than the self-confessed prejudice? So if I say, yeah, I'm willing to be biased X amount, in a case where you probably shouldn't be, like I think scientific standards would say you shouldn't admit that you would be biased against a a paper, reviewing a paper, because it has different political views than your own. Um, Wouldn't we expect the bias to actually probably be larger than the self-report? I think that's a, um, a useful heuristic, but I think there are enough counterexamples where you find the reverse to be worried. Um, So, for example, a lot of times people will think that they are willing to discriminate in the abstract, but when you're actually confronted with uh, someone of another group that you are prejudiced against, you realize, oh, this is a real person with thoughts, beliefs, motivations, and values. Mm -hmm. And so um, whatever that group status is kind of washes away. I see. And I think okay. a lot of times when you're asking people, you know, are you prejudiced uh, toward these people, you're mm-hmm. asking them to kind of, in, in some ways, it's a task where you're asking them to imagine someone who is only this quality, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who's only mm-hmm. conservative. Right. And right. That might be different from, again, real life where you read their paper or you look at their work and sure, you might in the back of the head know they're conservative, but you also got so much other information about mm-hmm. them. Uh, And so I think uh, there are a bunch of classic studies showing exactly this phenomenon where people profess, I'm going to discriminate against Chinese people. I'm not going to let them, uh, you know, uh, stay at my hotel. But then when a Chinese couple actually goes up to your hotel lobby, you let them in just like you would let in any other customer. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think another thing is also just that particularly with kind of complex social systems like academia, there are so many other barriers that our systems put up into place. Mm -hmm. that could wash out these biases in practice. Um, Mm -hmm. One study that I often think about when I think about this is um, uh, my colleague Patrick Forsher looked to see if there were uh, biases by grant reviewers in evaluating uh, NIH applications, National Institutes of Health. And they found that at least, you know, when you do the kind of carefully controlled experimental design where you randomly assign them, uh, reviewers, these grant applications, and they varied in, in the race and gender of the applicants, there mm-hmm. was no racial or gender bias in uh, mm-hmm. scientific reviewers' evaluations. So this is the thing where, you know, probably if you asked uh, a, a, a lot of folks in science, you know, is there going to be racial or gender bias in evaluating NIH grants? A lot of folks might have that intuition, but when mm-hmm. you actually put it up against the hard evidence, it, there isn't evidence of it, at least in the evaluation stage. So I think this is where we shouldn't perhaps rely too much on these heuristics of, aha, it must be there, or aha, it must not be there. Yeah, I think, okay. I think also with, like, social scientists, too, because we're so aware that people have biases, that we would be particularly likely to confess that, well, maybe not. I mean, a lot of people's responses to our paper was like... (laughs) <laughs> They're that's like, surely all face. people are biased, but we're not, and we're fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, that's, but yeah. at minimum, like, we should all know that people have biases, and then we should be like, hmm, I'm a person too, and yeah, maybe. I think the best. problem. Don't you think the? I think the problem is people don't see it as a bias, and so if I write a paper in which I maintain there might be genetically caused group differences and it gets rejected, I don't think the reviewers think I'm biased. They think this is wrong and it's garbage and that's why I rejected it, right? So it's really hard if, if you think that that has to do with the tr- you know, truth claims, it doesn't seem as though it's a bias, right? Mm. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know if that's true. I would like to do the kinds of experiments I completely agree with Calvin, which is uh, we need better evidence. And uh, that's why I like the con. I think I pretty much agreed. I mean, I, I quibble with points here or there, but I, I totally agree that we do need better evidence. And I sort of saw our argument as a uh, call an for to, 
yeah other uh, people uh, help us collect better right, more systematic some... data on it. like do you think it's plausible enough that you want to work hard to figure out if this is true or not <laughs> right because it turns out it's really hard to do this right because yeah. the, the most straightforward experiment one could think of is writing two papers that are basically exactly the same except for you flip the demographic group that you're talking about or you or flip you change the, the conclusion somehow exactly in and a way that you, would be like equalitarian friendly or not yeah. right and then you submit to a journal and see what happens the problem is that's probably unethical i doubt I wanted that. to do this yeah with like get uh, an editor on board and then have them send the same paper out to like 200 people <laughs> but like yeah you're wasting a lot of time from people who don't have a lot of time and i just think you probably can't do it ethically yeah so, so are, are, are the two of you against these types of experimental audit studies period or just you think scientists are a special in some way in that we shouldn't do it with scientists <laughs> i would like to do it like I'm i thought i thought it would be fun to do it in like a way that minimized the time commitment because if you're going to trick people into participating it shouldn't be a four-hour commitment it should be like a 10-minute commitment <laughs> so yeah, if you could do hard. like a poster like evaluate a poster or something right right yeah, yeah i think um that is like often kind of one of the moral quandaries like the nih study that i told you for example they actually got the active um there, it was an active collaboration with NIH, so the NIH was just like, "All right, yeah, you can go do this on our on grant reviewers." It is okay, and I think particularly for if you're do if you're social scientist doing it on social science, it's not like you're doing it to this kind of far off population. You're doing it to your friends right. or your friends of friends. <laughs> it's like you know, there's the, you're doing it to the entire social network yeah. of people that are actually professionally quite close to you, and so. I, I I guess like the way that I see like this worry about like ah. Oh, but we shouldn't do it on scientists. To me, it feels like an in-group bias in the sense that like, we do it all the time. We do it to pol <laughs> politicians, we do it to doctors, we do it to uh, uh, hard si science faculty. Why not do it on social scientists? I think that I'm personally okay, but I do understand how it, it feels more painful when it's we know exactly what doing this would look like. What right? it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like You're like, oh man, I put in three hours on that journal review and it turns out it was you know it was just yeah. an experiment but i actually, didn't really think about if that would anger me personally I, I think it's worth it i think it's worth it to have the information because i think this is a serious problem potentially and we would like to know how real is this are are the claims that the people in the social sciences biased crowd make plausible are they supported by the best exper experimental evidence we can gather now yeah. all of our listeners are going to be suspicious anytime they get a new manuscript. <laughs> they're going to be like, is this part of their study? <laughs> and then they're going to be like excessively friendly to like the pro-equalitarian or the anti-equalitarian papers. <laughs> Thus proving that Gergen was right and all social psychology is just history. I that, don't get it. That reference was lost. Yeah, I don't get, Sorry. I don't get the reference <laughs> Sorry, Gergen was this social psychologist, and he made the argument that social psychology is inevitably history because knowledge about an experiment actually changes behavior. Mm -hmm. So let's yeah. say we do the Milgram experiment, and then we disseminate information about it, and that actually changes how people would behave the next time they do it. So it's sort of as if once you made Newton's laws, like 9.8 meters per second, per second it, rocks decided to fall at 4.2 meters per second. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, remember. that's certainly the explanation for the replication crisis. <laughs> that 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 was like a really common, exp I mean, I think it's still fairly common explanation for why some of these stereotype threat effects don't replicate. And I, I remember the one time I tried to do a, a study that was somewhat related to stereotype threat, we did the funnel debriefing at the end. So we asked them, what do you think the study was about? And like, it was about stereotype threat. Duh, you had an Asian woman. And I'm like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah, so like they weren't wrong <laughs> yeah so i mean in some cases it probably is true that yeah having knowledge about these things does um does change it so uh well cory do you have any um yeah no um so yeah so in, in general i thought a lot of the points you raised were we're good ones um, for our evidence. And I think we actually completely agree with, I think 
pretty much agree with almost every single thing you said in terms of the limitations of the evidence we provided. There might be some exceptions to that, and maybe Bo would have some exceptions to that as well. Um, but I think the ones that are sort of interesting are the ones we've sort of been talking about already with the IAT or with stereotype threat or with growth mindset. Um, because those do seem to me to be the kinds of effects that get big in social psychology. And to me, also the effects that have been sort of the biggest, uh, maybe letdowns or something, um, where we thought they were more important than they really were. And why do you think you get the sort of category of findings that have gotten this outsized attention and that have been sort of overhyped and that have caused these interventions out in the world, potentially before we even knew if we needed the interventions to begin with, I suppose? Um, do you just kind of disagree with that? I, I guess I'm just curious your view of the field, how it might differ from ours on those kinds of um, ideas. Um, so I, I'm thinking of it in terms of just those three examples that you just mm -hmm. mentioned. And I, I think that some of this is is um, kind of a, a unavoidable, at least very difficult to avoid implication when something just enters the public imagination. Right, mm -hmm. the research begins. There's some public attention on it, and then all these practitioners are going to come in and bring it in every direction. Uh, and a lot of us researchers aren't don't have that much power to like change what the public expects of the research. And so a lot of the research, you know, when it comes to things like uh, mindset or implicit bias or uh, stereotype threat, like it is in my mind kind of proceeding as it should maybe. Some might think a little slower than one would want or just the right amount or whatever. But like part of why we know that they don't work is because scientists continue to scrutinize it and establish mm -hmm. boundaries for the extent to which these um, phenomena actually matter. Um, it's just a little, it gets more complicated when uh, the public is also kind of doing their own thing on the side all the time. And it's not like there's a certain point that I think to me, it's, it's hard for me to think of like, there's a certain point when we know it's ready for prime time. Sometimes you just have to start um, throwing it out there and it becomes apparent over time which ideas are generalizing to field settings or not, right? We can run mm -hmm. all the beautiful lab studies and small scale studies that we want, um, but it isn't until you know these things start to be applied at scale that we can understand more about their theoretical boundaries. And one example of that is in education research where a lot of times they have these great interventions that are hand designed by educational researchers that have these wonderful effects on a school, a district, or a couple districts. But then when you start implementing it statewide or nationwide, things start to fall apart, right? New things start to happen that you couldn't have anticipated, like teachers not complying with your curriculum. And so I think, you know, it it's hard for, I guess, yeah, to go back to the original point, it's just hard for me to like be like, okay, we should have waited longer. Um, I think these things are just so hard to anticipate uh, until you're looking back after the fact in which I wish it went another way. But so you're, are you saying you think like the overhyping of these findings happened from the public and not from social scientists? Because, I mean, you can look at citation counts, you can look at who's winning awards. Um, I think part of the reason these things make it to the public is because social scientists are focusing on them so heavily. Like I did an analysis of like the SP. SP program. And I think the word stereotyping, granted, there was a category of submission stereotyping and prejudice, I think, for a poster session, but there are lots of categories for submission for posters in different sessions. The word stereotyping was in the program more than the word personality. Um, and it's social and personality, uh, SPSB. What is it? Social and personalities. What I don't. What does SPSB stand for? Society, Society for personality. personality and Social yeah. Psychology. Yeah, <laughs> and stereotyping was in there more than the word personality, which is just like that. I think there is. The field has like particular obsessions with particular. We don't have to call them an obsession. Let's say interests, particular interests and particular ideas, and and they don't necessarily always the things that they glom onto don't always seem to be the things that are the strongest or maybe um, the most important for understanding the world, which is presumably what we're trying to do. 
Um, I, I see what you're getting at, and I definitely agree in the sense that, like, certainly, you know, any pocket of social scientists is going to have certain trends or certain things that the field finds particularly interesting. Um, I, but I don't see that necessarily as an issue related to the fact that there are exaggerated effects. I think it's more just about um, particular research cultures and what people are, are inclined to be interested in, right? So for example, social class, the study of social class is huge for most social sciences outside of social psychology, but due to some historical accident, it's not very big in social psychology at all. And it's not, you know, like I think there are a lot of these types of things where certain things caught on and other ones did not. Um, and I don't find that necessarily attributable to like this kind of exaggerated effect phenomenon. <clears throat> Do you think, let's just imagine a, a universe in which we'll just stick with social psychology in which 90%, let's say 93% of social psychologists were Trump voting populists, <laughs> right? Let's just imagine that world. Do you think that the field would look significantly different from what it looks like right now? And that is the, the studies that they conducted, the things that they touted. Do you think that that would look quite a bit different? Um, so I think that, A, I think it would if we were just to simply transplant, take all the people out and then put them in. But I think there's also something to the fact that uh, the social sciences, um, each social science has a particular type of canon of findings that are going to be mm -hmm. more amenable to some ideological worldviews uh, rather than others. So I don't think mm -hmm. that like this kind of thought experiment of if we just simply transplanted Trump supporters and nothing else changed, like that is necessarily as useful as one might think because like, you know, perhaps part of why many social psychologists are liberal is because uh, we bought into this idea that the situation and the social environment can be powerful determinants of behavior and that uh, there are aspects of people's minds that incline us toward prejudice and stereotyping. So what's interesting about that explanation, though, which I think has at least prima facie plausibility, is that it doesn't account for social psychologists' views towards homosexuality or transgenderism. So, for example, if I were to make the claim that uh, widespread celebration of transgendered ideology will cause more people to become transgendered. I think social psychologists would be very irritated with that claim and that they would maintain that it's a very biological phenomenon and the same thing with homosexuality. So those are actually two, uh, two cases in which social psychologists are overwhelmingly biologically based in their thinking. Or do you think, or would you disagree with that? I mean, I would make the same prediction, um, uh, but we don't have the data. <laughs> I agreed, but do, I mean, I, I, okay, so yeah, you're right. We don't have the data, but let's just pretend for a second. Doesn't that suggest that some of what they think you can change and what you can't change is not just an inevitable product of the worldview of social psychology, but rather it is somewhat political. They have certain desires about what you can and can't change or what is and isn't influenced socially. Yeah, and I, I think that this is a case where I think that there is no sign, there isn't, to my knowledge, much scientific evidence looking at how people come up with research ideas and which ones they choose to pursue. Mm -hmm. And I would love for that evidence to exist. Yeah. I think as just a practitioner of social science research that I just do it, it's a thing that I worry about a lot in terms of us not having sufficient content coverage in terms of what uh, is happening out there in the social world around us, right? Um, uh, Baumeister has written about this. Um, uh, you know, many folks have written about this idea that like we're just studying such a thin slice of what uh, people are doing or what people are thinking. And it, it is a real, um, Concern. I think where, when it comes to diagnosing the extent and magnitude of the bias, they're just there's a lot of these kind of anecdotes and not that much yeah. hard evidence showing it. Um, yeah. I think that's I think, right. I, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Go yeah. ahead. I also just think that like part of what makes this tricky is that each of us have our own little hobby horses. Like I really yeah. wish lots more people would study social class. I also think movie spoilers are very important, but no one else does. Movie spoilers? Like, movie spoilers. That's going to be my post-tenure. Like, really? 
<laughs> like, like, like what about them? I just think that like they ruin movies. Um. <laughs> yeah. Thought, so like, uh, why do people research that suggested that it, they actually didn't? Well, they they tried to replicate it recently, and it didn't replicate. Ah, okay. Um, but I also think that they're maybe there because the spoiler is the reason that it didn't replicate. Because they're like, we know how this is turning out. So just from <laughs> from your perspective, just intuitively, from you, if you if I tell you like what happens at the end of seven, that would ruin the movie for you. Yeah, and I would never watch it. Um, but I have watched it, so you can spoil it for me. Okay. <laughs> but we don't know about our listeners. <laughs> yeah, maybe somebody out there has not seen it yet and doesn't um, know what's in the box. <laughs> but I think you can always play this game of, like, some topics are understudied. Because that is always going to be happening by virtue of we have limited resources. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, so I, yeah. Where I don't think it's necessarily playing a game, though, is to point out that there does seem to be sort of a political uh, bend to what's studied and what isn't studied, right? That, that would be, I guess, so like, uh, give me, I'll give you an example I was thinking about when we were talking about what gets popular in the public imagination and what doesn't. There's very widely replicated literature with huge effect size on sex differences and interest of, just to simplify, living things versus dead things. That's how Cosmides puts it. I like that. Um, and men consistently show a preference for dead things, quote unquote, and women for living things. And these Wait, men like dead things more than living things, or they like dead things more than women like dead things? It's relative. So their okay. relative preference is one way versus women's is the other way, right? So the, the so sort of they're, 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 um, I can't think of the term, the adva comparative advantage is in that, is in dead things, right? Now, that actually likely explains a lot of the disparities in programming, uh, programming careers, engineering careers, etc. When, when James Damore wrote his infamous memo, when that went public, I looked at all of these outlets, Vox, etc., and nobody even mentioned that literature, despite the fact that it's. What That's is my that? pants phone. <laughs> I'm gonna turn it off. <laughs> Should we pause That's, for a second? Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> um, yeah. So, this, despite the fact that this literature is very widely known, it, it as far as I could tell, it it made almost not even a peep in the in the public conversation about this. So I, I wonder about that. That's what I wonder about, is why would a literature that seems very germane hardly be discussed, whereas this other literature gets discussed all the time? Um, well, my feeling is like, you know, it could be discussed, but like, for example, like conservative news media don't pick up this information and they don't use it. Um, I think that a lot of uh, the scientific findings that we have can be interpreted many different ways. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens in the world that we live in, in terms of uh, what gets typed, it's usually liberal news media sources like Vox, like MSNBC, that has more enthusiasm, enthusiasm mm -hmm. in terms of showing it to the readers and publicizing it and so on. Um, mm -hmm. This feels to me like not necessarily so much um, uh, like, you know, a scientist are erring in some dramatic way, unless mm -hmm. um, it's more about the fact that we have a lot of these scientific findings that theoretically could be interpreted from a conservative point of view, but just aren't, right? So this idea, for example, that implicit bias and that we are all inclined toward bias could be interpreted from a conservative lens as as a way to justify um, the fact that we do discriminate, um, but due to the way that um, uh, scientific journalism happens in the in the sense that it's often for a liberal audience, mm -hmm. uh, journalists never really picked it up that way or framed it that way, right? Um, and I think there's a um, you know even with for example the finding that you mentioned with um, the way that I have heard about it is like men are more interested in inanimate objects and women are more interested in uh, people. Yeah. Um, is that that also has a liberal frame and that has been at least quite successful in some of my circles, which is that if you start to frame fields like computer science um, 
as a pro-social endeavor, right? You mm -hmm. can program to create these great apps that are going to help promote uh, the lives of others. Uh, then suddenly, uh, women and girls get more interested in pursuing computer science, right? So same finding, you can interpret it as like, ah, so this yep. is just the way the world is, right. or, oh, well, that shows us an environmental level. If we just frame it a different way, now suddenly um, uh, more women and girls will be interested in supporting a kind of liberal slant on things. And I, I, my suspicion, you know, is that a lot of our findings actually do kind of look like that, right? Mm -hmm. Things like grit and uh, uh, these kind of mindset interventions, for example. I was mm -hmm. actually surprised that you mentioned that as an example because at least in my very liberal circles, a lot of times that's seen as just like a way to prop up this, these kind of intensely meritocratic ideas mm -hmm. that you just need to try harder and then you will succeed, right. Right? Right. Um, yeah. right? So yeah, um, that's a good point. I think well, that's, a, that's a place where I'm a little bit um, uneasy or just uncertain about like the extent to which our social fi science findings are like inherently liberal or conservative. I think it's more about the type of overlay that mm -hmm. um, journalists are putting onto our findings. And I'm, 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 at least anecdotally, I feel like certainly some of us researchers do so as well in terms of how we interpret them. Mm. Um, well, but I don't have the data to support that. What's interesting about that, that claim about the inanimate versus people thing is that's exactly what James Damore said. In fact, what he said in his memo is basically like we need to be aware of these differences so we can attempt to, to rectify the problem. And he got fired for that, of course. <laughs> and also, when you read the write ups at Vox where they called it a sexist screed and a Jeremiah and all of this stuff, they criticized him intensively for making claims such as, on average, women are more neurotic than men, which is absolutely 100% true. And there, I don't, to my knowledge, there's not a lot of dispute about that in the relevant empirical literature. I agree with you, though, that there is, I think, and in, I think Corey and I maybe didn't focus on this as much as we should have. I think there's a difference between the actual science and the, the sort of media the way they present it. And I think the science is better and less biased than the way it gets presented in the media. I think there are problems in the science. And, you know, we, we laid that out. But I think the media are worse about it, the way that they present it. Because you're right, a lot of these things could be framed both conservatively and liberally. But the media pick it up and it generally becomes liberal, in my estimation. Or if it's not, the people get excoriated. And where I think there's a massive asymmetry is there is nothing I could say, nothing liberal I could say, no matter how wrong, that would get me fired or that would get me in trouble, <laughs> right? Whereas there definitely is something I could say that goes against it that would get me fired or get me in trouble or get me chastised by Vox, etc. That asymmetry to me is interesting and seems to suggest there really is this a, a problem with bias because there's no way to go wrong one side. There is definitely a way to go wrong the other way. So I want to push back on that a little bit because I, I think that while, you know, if I had to bet, like, I think that, um, you know, you know, con conservative leaning academics do get chastised a lot more. It's not like those of us who publish evidence that's amenable to a liberal worldview are immune. Mm -hmm. I routinely get quoted in ways that feel like to me are out of context or or, or used to kind of support a view that I, I don't like. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, perhaps I would I would actually bet that like a lot of this research on these politically divisive issues are given much more scrutiny mm -hmm. than uh, topics that are not politically divisive, right? Because people have these um, uh, competing motivations. Um, and so like those of us who are publishing evidence that's, that is amenable to a liberal worldview are often, um, uh, our, our, our intentions are questioned, the quality of our evidence is cited, ah, that uses a university sample, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of like whether or not that amounts to like, uh, you know, the kind of really big ticket things of, for example, getting fired um, or being denied tenure or something. I, 
I think that it would be really nice to see what the evidence on the rates of it happening one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't think of it as a situation where like it's only happening to conservatives. I think it's happening to many of us that are working in politically divisive. That's topics. fair. That's a very fair statement. But here's what I do know. I don't, I could, I am not afraid to say anything liberal leaning in my class. I could go in there and say everything socialization. There's no such thing as human nature. And I think people would tell me I'm wrong, but I wouldn't be afraid of getting complaints or getting sent to my provost office, right? <laughs> like, it does seem to me that that suggests that there is an asymmetry. And if you go too far one way, you could lose your job and at minimum get denied tenure, get chastised by your bosses. Whereas if you go the other way, yeah, I agree with you. You're right. There, I'm sure there are, there are people who question your motives and scrutinize the, your literature more carefully than, say, morally or, I mean, politically indifferent literature. But I don't okay. think... Sorry, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm just... I, oh, I, just I, was, I was just wondering, weren't there cases of professors who are like excessively communist who got in trouble. Did I read about this like a few months ago? You guys, of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> the only thing I know where the thing where you get, I, I think where you actually get bias against very progressive people is on Palestine, Israel. That's one mm -hmm. where you definitely can get people fired. Norman Finkelstein, a prominent critic of Israel, for example, I think was denied tenure because of that. And of course, I would strongly support people's right to say whatever they want about that issue. But that doesn't have particular relevance for social psychology. Yeah, I mean, you would need to do some kind of, again, you need a more systematic analysis. Yeah. Could we look at all the people who've ever been fired <laughs> from their academic jobs? What do right. they think the reason is? What does their university say the reason is? Yeah. Are they liberal or conservative? Do you want to try this experiment and we'll just see if we can all get fired? <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I think I, you bring up an interesting point. Like, I wonder how much of it is really coming from the media and how much of our findings are kind of getting skewed in a particular way. I've had conversations with journalists, um, or I, I'm thinking of one in particular, I won't say the person's name, but like, I could tell they wanted me to say this thing that I didn't think I should say. And it was like, a more liberal spin on my particular results and like I wonder if that happens because the the media I think is actually maybe even more liberal than social scientists <laughs> um and also they just don't they care more about the headlines right they want people clicking whereas we're like well somebody is gonna try to replicate my findings I have to make sure they're real <laughs> um so there are different incentives so I wonder how much of it is happening at that level. It's when our findings are talked about by people, and then that's that kind of how they bring um, I didn't hear that last part. It cut off a little bit. But um, I, I feel like a lot of times, at least my, I feel like I get a, um, a fair bit of like conservative leaning or journalists, or like journalists with a kind of conservative message, like they know the story they want to write about how implicit bias is bunk. And then I also sometimes <laughs> will get requests from journalists about how pervasive and widespread implicit bias is in new topic X, right? Like about how uh, social workers are incredibly discriminatory due to implicit bias. Like, well, the studies haven't been done. Um, and I feel like it's a, a lot of times it going to kind of Penny Cook's critique. Like it's like they have this certain belief or this certain conclusion about what they want the story to be. Mm -hmm. And as scientists, you know, we don't get training on this, but we have. It's hard to stay resolute to the the way that they frame the questions and the way that they might kind of nudge you to give a quote that fits the story they want to write. Yeah, and you're like, oh, cool, a reporter's talking to me, and you want you want to say something that they find interesting, but. Yeah, that, that is that is interesting. You probably do get it both ways. That makes a lot of sense. Um, but um, yeah, I wonder and, how much. Yeah. Um, can I go back a little bit to the like how often like liberal versus conservative academics are um, kind of targeted by these things? Mm -hmm. um, one thing that, that gives me worry is what I think of as the Florida man phenomenon. So um, 
I think at least many people on the internet like uh, hear about all these crazy things that happen with Florida men doing ridiculous things like you know play yeah. with alligators or whatever Eating faces. <laughs> yeah. and it turns out why part of why that stereotype came about was that uh, Florida had these laws where um, like basically any type of like uh, criminal activity or something like it like would just go on some public record so it'd be easily visible to people mm -hmm. whereas in other states a lot of times you have to manually request it um, and this little thing made it seem like Florida folks uh, Florida men were like way crazier than the rest of uh, the US population. A similar thing could be happening where because I think there is such a strong media narrative right now about conservative academics or people mm -hmm. with conservative leaning ideas uh, under fire that like anytime something like that happens, it really yes. gets picked up and, and spread in all these different places. Yeah. Uh, but when far left people are, are doing it or are, are subject to these, we don't hear about it as often. Yeah. And so while I would probably still bet that there is a gap, mm -hmm. um, I would, I would probably predict that the gap might be smaller than we think um, because of the differences in the media coverage issue. Yeah, I no, I absolutely think that that's, that's a fair thing. And as somebody who recently went through this, I can tell you, <laughs> I expected that a bunch of conservative outlets would interview me and say, look, at, and in fact, you know, to the extent that they got it wrong, which a lot of them did, it was like, conservative professor, fi first of all, I'm not conservative, but it would be, you know, conservative professor fired by left-wing mobs or something. <laughs> what are you? I think our viewers would like to hear. I'm a, I am consider myself a <laughs> moderate populist, pragmatist, centrist. Oh, okay. <laughs> but just no, one of the standard groups. Yeah, but you are very right, Calvin. I think that's a fair point. I, I think the reason that I care so much about each individual firing, and of course I, I, I care about it on both sides. I'm just not as familiar with social psychologists who got fired for being too liberal. The reason I care so much is because each individual firing is a warning to other people not to not to do what that researcher did right and so i think for each person who gets fired there are a hundred people who aren't going to study those topics or aren't going to talk about them and that creates more bias in the field and i will tell you i mean i again this is i know this is anecdotal we need more evidence here but i know a lot of people privately who will send me messages and talk to me and say you know i think what you're doing is probably correct or at least it's on the right track and like it's interesting but i'm not going to talk about it and don't tell anyone I said that. <laughs> and yeah, and don't tell anybody who I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's like, yeah. that's a really big deal. And that definitely creates a chill wind in, social, in the social sciences that creates a lacuna, this whole area what we could be studying, right? So that's why I care about it. But you're right, we should know the objective answer of how many people on either side, et cetera. Well, someone who's listening, do an analysis of I think all of the people. Sachs who Sachs has done it. I think really? Sachs has a, he has a list. But I think mm -hmm. the thing is, if you look at it, the liberals who get fired aren't in social science. So you're not Where getting liberals they? fired for doing social political science and stuff. And often it's for like making a statement about like, you know, like f the police or something like that mm -hmm. it's it's usually like if you look at them there are like extracurricular statements more than this person was doing a line of research that argued that socialism was better or whatever mm -hmm. um well we're at like an hour and a half <laughs> oh really wow <laughs> and my heart has been broken to find out that liberal or that florida men are not actually worse <laughs> I mean, there might like still be some truth to that cut. idea. There's something crazy about Florida. <laughs> yeah, there's something crazy about Florida. Corey what and I live my... there, and we know it's just crazy. Yeah, <laughs> one of my favorites was like a it was like a Florida man who got arrested, and like when the cop asked for his ID, he handed the guy a taco. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I love the idea that someone's just walking around with a taco in their pocket. <laughs> yeah, you can tell it's me because it's my favorite type of taco. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right well thanks very much for coming on hey, calvin do we get final statements oh that's right yeah we usually do if, yeah if you let me make have, mine so we'll calvin see. can have the last word yeah, let me just thank calvin very much for being on here and for writing his comment and let me say that i agree almost 
thoroughly with most of what Calvin has said here. And I think we do need more research. And also I would say, I think in the long run, and I think the examples that we've given, such as IAT, stereotype threat, growth mindset, et cetera, I think in the long run, science actually is pretty self-correcting. And you're right. These are examples where we've actually had robust debate about it and the evidence has come in and, and we're more skeptical of these ideas than probably we once were. And that's how science should work. I think where we probably get the most bias is in the topics people choose to study, one, and we need more evidence on that, and two, the media and the way the media present it. And, and there might be multifarious reasons for that, but I think that's also a big problem. So in general, thank you for coming on. And I agree with almost all of what you've said. I'll say quickly that, yeah, I feel the same way. I think we thought you did a really good job critiquing a lot of the evidence we put forth. So I strongly encourage people who read my and Bo's paper to read Calvin's as well. Um, his, I think, along with Jay Gordon Pennycooks was a critical of how we talk about bias, and I thought his was really cool too. We would have him on, but I think it's a little bit too nerdy to talk about how. Yeah, uh, what, what yeah. is bias? Um, but uh, yeah, I think what we need is a lot more research and more systematic ways of testing all of these things. And I think we put out a lot of research ideas during this talk, so I hope people will do them so that I don't have to. Right, um, and I, I just wanted to kind of add on a little bit. Yeah, I think that you know there's much more research that just needs to be collected. Um, and I want to emphasize that just because there's a lack of really strong evidence doesn't mean that uh, there's a lack of discrimination. It just means that it hasn't been collected yet. Uh, and understanding whether it's happening uh, at in terms of discrimination, in terms of selective interpretation, uh, in terms of what research ideas we select, or in terms of how maybe sometimes the media may kind of uh, have per perverse effects on the operation of science. Understanding where it's happening or if it's happening is really important for developing useful interventions to prevent mm -hmm. you know, some of these uh, undesirable effects, whatever we, we think it might be. Yeah. That's it. Cool. Uh, you don't have to hang up, but I'll end the recording. <laughs> <laughs>